Positive Light. I'm your host, Joni Lane. If you are tuning in live today, you are just watching the live streaming of a current fire that has just started. Um, it was raw footage, and Terry Larson did a wonderful job of filming that. We will be repeating that film again after my show, if you're interested in finding out more about it. Also, I was handed an advisory evacuation I'd like to read for those who are watching live. The public information uh, released an advisory evacuation. A wildfire has been reported in the Jerusalem grade area. The Lake County Sheriff's Office has issued an advisory for the possible evacuation of the area. The advisory includes Jerusalem grade from Spruce Grove Road east to Canyon Road. Spruce Grove Road from Jerusalem Grade Road north to Noble Ranch Road, which includes all of Black Bass Pass and East Road. An evacuation advisory is not a mandatory evacuation, but it is strongly recommended. Residents are advised to gather their medications, pets, and important papers. Residents should be prepared to leave the area with little notice. So again, this is a new fire that had just started not too long ago, within the hour, and it is on um, Black Bass Pass area. So please stay tuned um, to your local. Um, uh, if you if you need more information on this, contact the um, emergency services in Lower Lake and in Middletown. If you do need to evacuate or choose to evacuate, there are evacuation centers available and you can contact the emergency services in your area, whether in, you're in Lower Lake or Middletown or in the Hidden Valley area. So again, there is an advisory evacuation for Black Bass Pass. Um, and as I said before, we will be rep repeating that footage of the fire directly after my show. So if you're interested, please stay tuned for that. And there will be updates on that fire as well. And here at LCM TV, we have the, the finest newscasters in the world. Terry Larson was out following the fire trucks and happened to get this footage, and it's really great footage. So if you're interested in learning more about the fire, please tune in after my show and continue to watch LCM TV to find out to stay abreast of opening um, upcoming news on that. So to continue with my show, and um, if there is an emergency, I may be interrupted to let you know that, but um, to continue with our show today, we are a positive light, and we are on every Monday at 3 p.m. I am your host, Joni Lane. I am the owner-operator of a positive light meditation center in Kelseyville, California, which is in Lake County, California. We've had a lot of fires here in Lake County, and we also have seen some of the most fantastic fire fighters I've ever seen. So I really commend them, and they work so hard, and they get very little rest. So I really want to um, send a big thank you out to the firefighters for keeping us safe. Um, Monday nights at my meditation center, we do hold meditation classes at 7 o'clock every Monday, and there's no cost for these. We are a nonprofit, and we work on donations, so we appreciate all the donations you can comfortably afford to give us. The second Tuesday of every month, I hold a 12 and Zen class, which is also at 7 o'clock, and there is no cost, and this is based on the traditional AA steps, and there has been a uh, Two other people working along um, with Bill Crombine, who wrote the book 12 and Zen, and have come up with Zen Practitioner 12 Steps, as well as Societal Normal 12 Steps. And we're going to be going a little bit more into that later on in the show. If you're interested in being a sponsor on the show, please contact me, Joni Lane, um, or with LCMTV.com. And uh, we will keep the cost as low as $40 for a really nice commercial for you. We are looking for sponsors. Um, so if you're interested in getting word out about what you have to advertise, please let us know. And we can talk about how we can make that happen. If you are interested in sharing a positive message or know someone with a positive message that you think may fit our show, 
please call me or email me and let me know who that is, how we can contact them, and how we can get them on the show as a guest. I love having guests on the show because it supplies various different kinds of views. My view isn't the only view. I try to give alternative uh, ideas, but everyone's got their own way of sharing things, and I love to see what other people have to share. So contact me at joni at a positive light dot com or call me on my phone and I will get back to you really quickly on that. I also wanted to let you know that I am a Reiki teacher. I am a master teacher and what that means is I have been trained and certified to teach Reiki, first degree, second degree, master and teacher. So if you're interested in learning Reiki, which is Japanese for universal energy, let me know and I would love to share that with you. I do hold classes fairly regularly and I put them to, together dependent on how often people are interested in doing that. So it's kind of a supply and demand type thing. If you're interested in learning it, let me know and I will put a class together. Sometimes the classes are as small as one or two people but as large as five to ten people too. And they're all very good and extremely interesting. I hold a uh, Reiki healing circle on the last Friday of every month and I do ask that you reserve a space for that because those classes fill up quickly. And the, the list, I only allow eight to ten people in there because I want to make sure that everyone gets their energy evenly and I don't want to cut anybody out. So if I, don't, if I have too big of a group, it's really not fair to everyone. So I try to keep the groups a little bit on the small side so that I can give everybody a really, really good two hours of energy. Um, November 8th, I will be having Kevin Griffin join us at a Positive Light, and he will be doing a day-long workshop with us. Kevin is the author of many books, and his recent book is Recovering Joy. And in this day-long retreat, we'll focus on ways to bring a light heart and clear mind to our recovery program. We we'll explore ways to cultivate joy using traditional Buddhist mindfulness teachings, 12-step teachings, and contemporary practices for increasing happiness and contentment. This workshop is only $50. Kevin's one of the leaders in the mindful recovery movement and one of the founders of the Buddhist Recovery Network. A longtime Buddhist practitioner and 12-step participant, he teaches nationally and internationally on the synthesis of these two traditions. And I urge you to join us for this very insightful day. Um, please contact me to reserve your space. The spaces are filling up, but we do have room. I believe Kevin will be um, coming back from Ireland on a teaching retreat about two weeks before this class. So he's looking forward to being a little closer to home, teaching a little bit smaller class. It's a little bit more intimate where he can share insights with people face to face instead of in front of a large audience of thousands of people. And normally charges much more money, so we're very fortunate that he's agreed to to stay with us again, as he has in the past, and keep his prices down so we can be, so we can afford to join him with these classes. Um, wonderful man, big heart, great insights. I urge you to uh, join me for this class. There really is nothing like taking an actual day-long workshop and showing up and actually talking to the people that are teaching, experiencing what they're trying to show you, practicing the meditations they suggest. And Kevin really is very good at um, teaching unique ways of having a relationship with not only your steps, if you're in a recovery program, but just meditation practice in general. So please know that you do not need to be in a recovery program to benefit from this workshop. He is a teacher at uh, Spirit Rock in Marin County, which was founded by Jack Cornfield, and he's got years and years of experience in meditation practice, so everyone gains from his classes. 
So some of the reasons for meditation, I teach meditation and I teach various types of meditation. I try to uh, provide people with a variety so that maybe one of them can strike a note and make a difference with them. Um, some of the reasons for taking the meditation classes is a teacher can help you understand what's going on with your thoughts, with the energy in your body, how you can let go of thoughts. Teachers can help make suggestions on what to do um, with your thoughts when they come into your mind. And everyone is different. Everyone's an individual. So each suggestion works differently on people. Um, having a teacher is important because you've got someone with some experience that actually has experience the things that you are bringing up. So for the most part, they have answers for you. And they have a variety of answers, like I said, that at least one of them will strike a note. One of them will ring true with you. And you'll, and you'll go, aha, you'll have those aha moments when you really get it, if you have a teacher. So if you don't join me for my classes, I urge you to contact a local uh, meditation center and find out what types of meditation they, they teach. I suggest beginning with mindfulness meditation. It's really kind of the basis of all meditation. And you get so many benefits out of learning how to let go of your thoughts and not get caught up in, in those thoughts. Jack Cornfield, who is one of my teachers, describes it as, meditation is discovering your capacity to be present for the mystery of your life as it unfolds before you. And I think that's a wonderful quote. It says quite a bit, discovering your capacity to be present for the mystery of your life as it unfolds before you. So. These moments that are in front of us, each moment, this moment, this moment, this moment, they all make up our life. And every moment can be a joyous moment. There are times in life when it's very difficult. Difficult things happen. But we can learn to not get caught up in the stories that we create in our minds. We can, we can learn to look at life as simply life as experiences. They're not your hardships or your joys. They are experiences. Some of them are joyous experiences. Some of them are difficult experiences. But they're simply experiences. And together they make up your life. When we get involved in an experience where we start taking ownership and creating something more out of it than it actually is, start dramatizing things, start getting caught up in those thoughts. We're actually not experiencing the moments that come to us. We're experiencing the moments that we're creating in our mind. And by doing that, we're often missing the moments that are there in front of us. So when we talk about our issues as, as people um, or things we need to work on, the first thing we need to become aware of of is awareness itself. Um, aware of your unconscious reactions when, you're, when you act without thinking, when you just react out of habit. If you begin to understand yourself well enough to see that you're caught up in an emotion and you're making something more out of it than you need to, oftentimes you're not being aware of the actual situation you're more aware of the situation you've created in your mind. And you're missing the point. So meditation can help simplify life for us. It can help us weed out the things that we've created and see the things that are real, the things that are true, and accept them, whether they're happy things or not. Meditation can help us become aware by seeing our thoughts during meditation, we can become aware of how we can have thoughts and let them go without getting caught up and carried away in them. 
the same way we can have feelings and emotions in everyday life, but not getting caught up in them or getting carried away with how we habitually react. So becoming aware of how we have thoughts is an important thing, and meditation can show us, identify our thoughts, identify the thoughts that are true, and let them go. Identify the thoughts that we're creating and let those go. We actually begin to see the truth of a situation and learn not to dramatize things and learn not to react to them quite so quickly. We learn through mindfulness to identify thoughts and let them go. And notice the thought, identify it, and then let it go. And not get caught up in the story and get caught up in all that that drama that we can carry around with us. That adds a lot of stress. And the number one complaint that people in the United States have is, I have a lot of stress and tension in my life. And mostly that's because we make the stress and tension in our life. We take a situation that we don't like and we create a story. We start arguing. We start, start fighting a fact. You can change things with your actions, but you can't change a reality. If something happens, it happens. You can deny it all you want, but it still happens. In the course of that denial, though, you are creating the stress. And so learning to identify your thoughts and let them go is a very important part of learning meditation. After learning the practice of meditation and identifying thoughts and learning to not get caught up in the story, we learn to separate. We learn to separate the things that we can look at from the things that we've made up. It's not really a clear line. And often, for example, if we're sitting in meditation, and we realize we've been thinking about, for 10 minutes, we've been thinking about what we're going to make for dinner. We know that we've got it caught up in a story. We didn't see the thought as, gee, I wonder what I'm going to make for dinner. Oh, there's a thought. Let it go. Now we're caught up in the thought that came, gee, I wonder what I'm going to make for dinner. And 10 minutes later, you've got a meal created because you got caught up in that story. There's nothing wrong with that. Because if you're intending to plan a dinner, then that's great. You're mindfully thinking about what you want to think about. But if a thought comes in during meditation and you don't want to think about it, learning to let the thought go and come back to your breath and your body and relaxing is an important way to learn how to relieve stress. Now, having said all of that about letting go of thoughts, um, I wanted to talk about 12 and Zen. And 12 and Zen is about taking your thoughts and allowing them to develop. But you're allowing the thoughts to develop along a line that you are controlling to a certain extent. So, for example, when uh, the graphic up on the screen right now shows an example of traditional AA, and a Zen practitioner, and the societal normal. Um, when you say, you, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. This is step one in traditional AA. Um, Roshi Bernie Glassman created the Zen practitioner steps. And in the first step for Zen practitioner, we have I admitted I was powerless over my attachments to my ego and not in control of my thought, my actions. Now, in societal normal, Herb Echo Deer created the 12 steps for societal normal. I admitted I have issues and unhappy because of them. So what we do during the 12 and Zen, the second Tuesday of every month at 7 o'clock, we look at these, and I write them up on a board so that we can look at them. And we may have six to eight people in this group. And we pick one of these 
steps, one of this version of step one, and we look at these steps and we think, which one rings true with me today? Each day something different happens. Each day we're in a different mood. So maybe one of them will ring more true with you than another. <clears throat> For example, if you wanted to uh, look at Zen practitioner, I admitted I was powerless over my attachment to my ego and not in control of my actions. And you began a meditation and you repeated that over and over and over and that's what you meditate on. You can look at a lot of things in this one sentence. Perhaps one of the words will jump out at you. I admit I was powerless. Admitted. The word admitted. Maybe if you meditate and that word jumps out, wow, what does that mean to me? Admitted. It means a vulnerability. It means a, a sense of not having control. I admitted something. It means to accept the truth, to look at yourself honestly. During the meditation on this one particular step, that word can become a lot of things. <clears throat> the word admitted can become a place of vulnerability, a, a place of truth, a place of honesty with yourself. I admitted I was powerless. Okay, there's a deep meaning to that. And when you meditate on something, the, the meanings open up. The depth becomes a little more clear to you. I admitted I was powerless. Admitting you're powerless over anything is very difficult for humans to do. But during meditation, I admitted I was powerless is a very big statement. And when you actually admit it and accept it and own that, it becomes something really large. It, be it opens up into knowledge of yourself, a little deeper knowledge of yourself. I admitted I was powerless over my attachment to my ego. Why do I need to be attached to my ego? During the meditation, you may ask yourself, why did I need to be attached to my ego? What does that mean? What does attachment mean? What does attachment to ego mean? When you admit you're powerless over your attachment to your ego, you're surrendering quite a bit because our ego is what feeds us. Our ego is what keeps us going in some directions. But when you admit you're, you're powerless over your attachment to your ego and not in control of your actions, it could mean you realize that your ego was controlling your actions. Perhaps you're um, a control freak. Maybe you need to have everybody do everything your way. You can't understand why people don't get that. You're trying to help them out. But when you're attached to your ego, when, you're, when your ego is telling you how to act and how other people should act, <clears throat> it's closing a lot of things out. <clears throat> Excuse me. You're closing a door on things when you allow your ego to control you, your thoughts, and your actions. There's nothing wrong with having ego. We all have ego. Having a healthy ego is being balanced. But when you're insecure, your ego tends to want to control things. So during a 10-minute meditation on this one step, I admitted I was powerless over my attachments to my ego and not in control of my actions. Many levels can open up. This can become very deep. You can start seeing things in yourself that maybe you weren't aware of. Maybe this one sentence can be an answer to things that you've been looking for. Wow, I didn't realize I was allowing that to happen. But I was. And now that I'm aware of it, I can at least be aware of it. If I can't make a change in it right now, at least I can be aware of it. And that's a big step. So let's just say, <clears throat> during this 10-minute meditation on this particular step, you've gotten to that point. And this door is opened up and you see this about yourself. That's very enlightening. 
you know, to learn things about yourself that, hmm, maybe I need to look at this a little closer. Maybe there's something I need to work on here. Without beating yourself up and without any judgment, just looking at what you've seen, what's been shown to you through this observance of this one sentence. Now, if you're in this 10-minute meditation and you've I've given you 10 minutes, and let's just say you've come to this realization, or you may come to completely different realizations. You may realize that, you know what, I'm powerless over my attachment to my ego, but I've never been in control of my actions. You know, maybe, maybe you don't see it the same way as the person sitting next to you does. Maybe something else opens up for you. And that's a wonderful thing. It probably will be different than anyone else's observation of this sentence. But then if I were to read the koan that goes with this, the Buddhist koan, and you've got this thing in your head that says, wow, I've just realized this. Through this meditation and being aware of my thoughts, I have just come to realize something about myself. And now she's reading this koan. It is as though you were up a tree, hanging from a branch with your teeth. Your hands and feet can't touch a branch. Someone appears beneath the tree and asks, what is the meaning of Zen? If you do not answer, you evade your responsibility or are discourteous. If you do answer, you lose your life. What do you do? So now you're meditating on this, Cohen, in relation to your step. You've admitted you were powerless over your attachment to your ego and not in control of your actions. How does that relate to hanging by a branch by your teeth? It's as though you were up a tree hanging from a branch with your teeth. Your hands and feet can't touch any branch, so you're suspended by your teeth on this branch. And someone is asking you a question, and you feel you must answer them, But if you do, you'll lose your life. So how is this any way connected to this sentence, I admitted I was powerless over my attachment to my ego and not in control of my actions? Well, you're not in control of your actions if you're hanging by a branch with your teeth and you can't touch a branch. You're not in control of your actions if someone is asking you a question. You're also powerless. You're hanging by your teeth. You're powerless. So this is how the, the 12 and Zen works. And as you take another 10 minutes and you start really meditating on this, hanging by your teeth, unable to touch any other branch for support, knowing that if you speak, you will lose your grip and fall to your death. But you must answer. It's a very, it's one of those things that makes you really think how, how we are always out of control of other people, places, and things. We can't control other people, places, or things. We can't control the person asking the question. We can't control the branch. We can't control the situation. You're powerless. And your ego really wants to take control. But hanging by your teeth, that could mean a lot of things. I know some people have said, you know, when I was hanging by my teeth, I felt like this branch was solid. It was the only solid thing in my life, and I really dug my teeth into it. So what they saw was that branch as a lifeline, as a strength, and they had their teeth deep in that lifeline, and they were not going to let go. What other people in the class may have come up with is the branch was my addiction or my issues that I need to deal with. And I really had my teeth in that. I was really attached to that. So the people might identify the branch as their ego. They were very attached to their ego, that branch. And they weren't willing to let go to see what would happen. They weren't willing to let go and let God let go and to see what happens 
will I die? Will I die? And we're going to die anyway. What does that mean? We're all going to die. What kind of death? Does it mean an actual physical death? Does it mean a, a death of an ego? You know, it may not be a literal physical death. Perhaps it represents the death of your ego and your struggle with it. So you can see what I'm saying is that after 20 minutes of meditating on a step, whichever one you choose, and allowing that to develop and open up into something for you, and then meditating on the Buddhist koan that, go, that is paired with it and seeing how that opens up, you can identify new things about yourself that you may not even be aware of. Wow, I didn't realize I was hanging onto my ego that hard. I didn't realize that it was okay to allow my ego to die if I let go, if that's what it meant to you. But the realizations that you can gain from this are amazing. And when the six or eight other people in the class share what they came up with, you see things in a whole new light because everyone is different, everyone experiences things different, differently, and everyone sees things differently. So when you hear someone else's view of it, you're thinking, oh, wow, I never, I never thought that, but that's really interesting. That's a great way of looking at it. And the things you learn about yourself during this one hour are amazing. Some of them are really funny. Some of them are, are kind of tragic. But, and you're not, you're not forced to share anything if you don't want to. It's fine. But if you do want to, sometimes it helps you develop more deep relationship with your step. And it helps you understand yourself a little bit deeper, too. So you can take this vision of understanding and allow it to develop and create something better, create a better you. So I hope that wasn't too confusing for you. I think it's pretty simple, and I'm sure that you got it. I think we're going to take a break right now and have a commercial, and then I'll come back with a different view on this. Thanks a lot. You are invited to participate in a true multimedia experience coming to a home near you. LCM TV is bringing Lake County into the new millennium with news, live broadcast, information, music, talk shows, and local programming, all streaming in high definition online and soon to be on your Roku box. Join us at lcm-tv.com or be a part of our studio audience. You can also watch the shows at lakecomagazine.com as we provide programming to inform, enlighten, and maybe even enrage you. On Lake County Magazine Talk Show with Terry and Pete the Tax Guy, Wednesday mornings at 9 a.m. Joni Lane brings a positive light to you every Monday at 3 p.m. Pasha Space brings an international flair as they discuss ecological, health, and social issues in Haiti with people around the world. End up your week with positive, conscious sounds on Saturday at 9 a.m. with Sister T on the bridge. This show is also simulcast on KMEC 105.1 FM in Ukiah. Our latest show, LCM TV News, is brought to you live Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays at noon, featuring national, regional, and local news, weather, and sports. We have it all here for you on your local TV station, LCM TV. Join us online and soon on Roku, giving you access to all the best Lake County has to offer. We are LCMTV.com, your multimedia connection. Tune in for the fun. It's live TV at its best. Hi, and welcome back to A Positive Light. I'm your host, Joni Lane. And before the break, we were talking about 12 and Zen and how that all works. Before I get... Um, any further with this, I want to also remind you that this was developed by Bill Crumbine, who was with the uh, Pacific Zen Institute in Santa Rosa. He has since moved on to bigger and better things, but he is still holding his 12 and Zen classes. And he has written a book called 12 and Zen. If you're interested in reading the book, please do. It's an amazing book and it gives you great insights. Um, you can find it on Amazon.com. It's an ebook form, and it's also in a paperback form. 
I understand that he's working on another book as well. And I do keep in contact with Bill. And I give him some feedback about some of the things people brought up in the class that we hold. Um, some of the feedback that they've come up with that wasn't in his book, but a different viewpoint. So he's interested in collecting those, those um, ideas and putting them into his new book. So we'll see how far that goes. Um, he has reasons for pairing up the Cohen's with the steps. And a lot of it was experimental. Um, some of the time he read the koan to a group who knew the 12 steps and allowed them to kind of meditate on the koan and see which step it reminded them of and how in relationship to that step it developed. So after months of doing that, he's taken notes and decided this koan seems to go with this step and this koan seems to go with this step. But he has two or three, or sometimes more, koans for each step. And he's, he's developing more and more. Well, like I said earlier, um, Herb Echo Deer, who is one of his uh, colleagues, has developed the societal normal 12 steps. And who knows what normal means? But a lot of times, people who are not in a recovery program hear so much about it and they think, wow, you know, 12 steps sounds pretty powerful, but I don't have addiction, so I don't need it. But then, if you talk to anyone in a 12-step program, they'll tell you, if the whole world used 12 steps, we'd have a great place. Because we take accountability for our actions in 12 steps, we are taught that our life is the way it is because we made it that way and we can make it any way we want. Using the steps to understand ourselves better, understand other people better, and um, they're very powerful. So Herb Echo Deer wrote the Societal Normal 12 Steps, thinking, you know, this might help the, quote, normal people. And then Roshi Bernie Glassman wrote the Zen Practitioner 12 Steps, and he is also um, part of the Pacific uh, Zen Center and thought, you know, 12 steps in any form can really help someone. Maybe the Zen practitioner 12 steps can help some of the people practicing Zen. So it gives you a variety to choose from. And I found that some of the people that come to our group are not in a recovery program, but they do use the traditional AA steps sometimes. Uh, for instance, in the first one, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. Um, they may say, um, I've admitted I'm powerless over other people, or powerless over my anger, or powerless over my addiction with food, or whatever it is, and that your life had become unmanageable because of it. So really, these steps can be applied to any, anyone who relates to any of them. A lot of the people who are in the 12-step 12 12 program do like the Zen practitioner steps. Or perhaps that day they really like that societal normal one. It's really speaking to them that day because they've had something happen that day that just rings with that step. So. Being open-minded is a really big part of working the 12 and Zen, and it's very exciting. Um, just learning what other people have to say about it and the way they view things gives us insight into other people. Understanding yourself is very important. It's the first step in becoming uh, more in touch with other people. Understanding yourself first. But hearing other people's views, is, it really helps open the door to understanding other people and think, wow, I see how other people think. There's other ways of viewing this. And you can allow them to see it their way, and you can learn from it. So, and sometimes it really is funny that the things that we think of, the things that pop into our mind. Um, so I urge you to come to the 12 and Zen. It's the second Tuesday of every month and at 7 o'clock. Um, we work every month, we add the next step. 
So the first is usually in January, but this time we've started a little bit later this year. And then the next month we go into step two. So let's go ahead and go on to step two, uh, traditional AA, which is from the big book. And Mark, would you put the graphic up there for the, the second step two of 12 in the Zen by Bill Crumbie? I think it was up there just a second ago. Was it? Yeah, the 12 and Zen every second Tuesday of the month at seven. Yeah, step okay. two, there it is. Great, thanks. So the traditional AA from the big book, step two is, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. The Zen practitioner by Roshi Bernie Glassman says, I came to have faith in an enlightened way. The societal normal second step by Herb Echo Deer is, became willing to do these steps believing we could heal if we do. So just because we stuck with the um, Zen practitioner on step one, let's go ahead and use Zen practitioner on step two. I came to have faith in an enlightened way. Now, if we meditate on that, I came to have faith in an enlightened way. Perhaps I came to have faith means something to you. First of all, when you come to something, when you come to believe or come to have faith, there's an action involved. There's, there's a purpose. I came. I, I eventually got to the point through life, I came to have faith in an enlightened way. Faith is something that we can't see. It's believing in something that we can't see and feel and touch, but we have an inkling, we have a suspicion that there's something there. I came to have faith in an enlightened way. Now, when you look at the words enlightened way, it's a way, it's a pathway, it's not a place. It's not a goal that we reach and then we're suddenly there at the summit. We came to have faith in getting there. That's what that means. We came to believe that we could become more aware and enlightened. The word way means pathway, right? It doesn't mean you're there. It means you're on your way. So if you come to have faith in an enlightened way, you realize through this meditation maybe that I could get somewhere with this. I could, I, I think this Zen steps might help me become more aware of myself, more enlightened about life in general, more aware of how other people see and feel and hear. It also might help you understand that you don't have control over, over other people, places, or things, that life is just life. Every day it happens. Every day we experience it. And we have no control, which is a form of faith. So during this meditation, came to have faith in an enlightened way is an action, it's a place, it's a, it's a pathway, it's a travel, it's a journey. And that can unfold a lot of things in the meditation for you. Ten minutes of that kind of thinking can really open up a lot of pathways and a lot of thoughts, a lot of possibilities that could be without really grasping and becoming attached to any one outcome. We can have faith that maybe this pathway can lead me to more enlightenment, more understanding. Now the Buddhist koan that uh, Bill Crumbine has paired with this is called Little Jade. So there you are sitting in your meditation with your Zen practitioner thoughts. I came to have faith in an enlightened way. And then suddenly she reads, a woman calls out to her maidservant, little Jade, little Jade, not because she wants something, but just so her lover can hear her voice. How in the world can this have anything to do with the step that we were just meditating on? I came to have faith in an enlightened way. 
came to have faith is something that you, you you don't see. You know it's possible. You know there's something there, but it's elusive. It's it's not tangible. When a woman calls out to her maidservant, little Jade, little Jade, she's doing something. There's an action involved. Came to believe or came to have faith in is an action. Maybe there's a relationship there. Maybe not. Not because she wants something, but just so her lover can hear her voice. Now, if you're going to have faith in an enlightened way, you may not be wanting a specific thing. You may not have something solid in mind. You may, but then you're being attached to something. But if you have faith, something unknown, in the unknown, and knowing that it will be positive, it's out there, it's floating in the air, it's floating in the air. Oh, maybe that means something. Came to, a woman calls out to a maidservant, little Jade, little Jade. Not because she wants something, but just so her lover can hear her voice. It's floating, her voice is floating, it's out there. Some of the things that Bill has written in his book regarding this particular step is he's, he's written these questions for you to ponder if you get stuck on this and you wonder, hmm, how do I progress with this? How do I move forward with it? Who delights in calling out little Jade? Who is that? A woman. A woman. A woman with a, uh, with a maidservant, but we don't know who that is. Who's calling? Who delights in calling out your name? What is, it, what is it like for you to hear your voice being called? Do you like hearing the sound of your own voice? Who is her lover? Is that her ego? Is that another person? Is that little Jade? Who is little Jade? In relation to this step, little Jade could be the enlightened way. Maybe this woman is calling out saying, I, I want to hear my voice ring with this pathway toward the enlightened way. Little Jade is a gem. It's, it's something special. So maybe this enlightened way is something special and gem-like. So these are things that, that Bill has written down and things that I've suggested, but maybe you're coming up with something completely different. Maybe you're relating to a woman calling out to her maidservant. What's a maidservant? Maybe you're coming out with, um, this is the way. My maidservant is the one that gives it to me. So she is the way. The way to enlightenment. The way to little Jade. Or maybe it's her voice. Maybe her voice is the way to enlightenment. So you see what I'm getting at when I, when I start making these different suggestions in your mind, in your heart, in your soul, what do these words mean to you? How do they open up? What develops when you meditate on them? What stories begin to create in your mind regarding this specifically? How does this relate to you personally? Can you become aware of something new through this? Maybe not. Maybe nothing comes to you, and that's okay. That's okay today. Maybe next time it will. What I also do at the end of these 12 and Zen meetings is I give you a copy of the steps and the koan. And I let you take it home. And I'm hoping by doing that, that sometime during that month, you'll pull it out and realize, wow, this really, something happened today where this came up. This reminded me of this situation, this step, this koan. And then you can take a meditation, a few minutes of meditation, even 10 minutes, and just see how that develops. Why did it remind you of that? What came up that was so much like that? Was it the words? Was it the situation? So this is how you can use these koans to help you understand yourself better, help you understand other people better. Now, Bill also suggests in this one particular part of the book here, 
A woman calls out to her maidservant, Little Jade, Little Jade, not because she wants something, but just so her lover can hear her voice. What about the times you've called out in need of help? And you knew you had been heard because someone came to your aid. Believing that a higher power is hearing your words is very comforting. <clears throat> Whatever that higher power is. And maybe your higher power is knowing your, maybe it's just you and your integrity. Maybe it's your friends. Maybe it's God. Maybe it's knowing that there's something better always on the horizon and that you're open to it. Maybe that's a higher power. So it doesn't have to be a religious concept. It can be something that is within you, in your heart, something you can relate to. But I do recommend going to Amazon and reading this book online or buying it paperback, but I urge people to use email. I mean e-books as much as possible. I use enough paper here. Um, and then come to the classes every second Tuesday at the Meditation Center and experience the group. Because when you experience the group, you hear five or six different people tell you five or six different stories, five or six different ways of looking at these things. And some of them are really insightful, things I would never come up with, but when they mention it, I think, wow, that's really cool. I'm going to have to think about that. That opened up a door for me that I really want to look at. So it's very educational. It's very fun. And uh, the last time we had apple pie. So there's another incentive right there. Who wants to give up apple pie? Especially a Gravenstein apple pie. Yeah, and I made it myself. It was good. See, now I'm bribing you to come. <laughs> so I'll give you one more example. And this one is, is, a, is a pretty pretty involved one. So what I suggest you do is I'm going to read the three versions of step three. And then I'm going to read the koan. And I'm going to invite you to uh, come back to my website, positivelight.com, watch the show again, listen to my suggestion, listen to my reading on these steps and the koan, and see if you can meditate on this and see what comes up for you. Because this is a really good one. I like this one a lot. And I like them all, but this one for some reason is really special for me. So in the traditional AA steps on step three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. Very important that you hear that, as we understood him, that could be whatever higher power means to you. Made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. The Zen practitioner step three. Without understanding it, I made a decision to practice an enlightened way. Without understanding it, I made a decision to practice an enlightened way. Societal normal. Let go of controlling our issues. Ask for help with them. Let go of controlling our issues and ask for help with them. Now, if you're listening to this, if you've gone to the website and you're watching this, you're listening to it, you can pause and uh, meditate on one of those steps for about 10 minutes. And see what comes up. See what opens up for you. The koan that is paired with this, you are being chased by a tiger, coming to a cliff you grab the root of a wild vine and swing yourself over the edge. The tiger you were fleeing from is sniffing at you from above. At the bottom of the cliff is another tiger waiting to eat you. Only the vine sustains you. Two mice, one white and one black, little by little start gnawing away the vine. Nearby, you see a luscious-looking strawberry. 
Holding tightly to the vine with one hand, you pluck the strawberry with your other hand and pop it in your mouth. How sweet it tastes. So I'm going to leave you with that. I hope you do practice this meditation, see what comes up for you. What does it mean? Feel free to repeat it a few times so you really get it and see what opens up for you. In the meantime, take care of yourself. Have a good week. I will see you next Monday at 3 o'clock. And if you'd like to stay tuned, if you're watching live streaming, stay tuned and watch um, the footage on the current fire that we unfortunately have in Jerusalem Valley. Um, hopefully it will be the last one. But we have some great footage on that from LCM TV, Terry Larson here at our show. And I urge you also to watch the news at noon here on LCM TV. So thank you for tuning in. Have a good week, and I will see you next Monday.